first of all, I would like to thank Lance Storm and Rob Tilly um, for inviting me here today to speak. And I'd like to thank you all for coming and listening to this presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank the committee members for doing such a great job in organizing events like this. So give them a round of applause. I think they deserve it. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the remote viewing, the insights into science and application of remote viewing. So we've already had some excellent speakers before me and some excellent topics. So you've had your uh, entree, you had the main menu, and now it's time for dessert. <laughs> Uh, just a quick warning, this presentation contains the names and images of people who are now deceased. If you are not willing to see them, that's probably not the presentation for you. All right. Hopefully it works. Okay, so who are you? Well, who I am to you, that depends greatly on your perspective. And I can tell you a little bit about what I've done. And I'm from the Netherlands originally, also called Holland, um, 16 million bicycles. <laughs> um, I'm an experiencer of psi phenomena. Most of the phenomena that have been discussed here I've also experienced. I'm also a trained remote viewer. I did my training with uh, David Morehouse. And I'm a trainer and assessor, I'm a researcher and an author. I've created the book Anomalies. And Anomalies is basically for people who have experiences who don't know what to do with them, just to make them feel that they're not alone in this world. There are other people out there who experience the same. For years, I felt pretty much alone in this world. And as a young person, as was rightfully said in the audience before, it is difficult, and I hope that this book will help get them through the journey. And a journey into anomalies, I'll give you an example. I was about 15 years of age, so I had an experience of my school teacher, and I was seeing a movie in my head of my school teacher parked on the side of a road while I was at home in the kitchen putting dishes in the dishwasher. And this movie started playing in my head and I thought, why is my school teacher popping into my head? Why can I clearly see him on the side of the road? And he got out of his car, he kicked the front tire, he was so angry, he was so upset. And at the same time, I was up in the tree, looking down over fields. I could see a windmill in the distance. I could see a village. And I thought that was really, really weird because I knew very well I was in the kitchen doing the dishes. <laughs> so the next day in school, I came across the school teacher and I asked him, what was wrong with your car yesterday? And he looked at me like, how could you know? There was no one there. And I said, yes, I know. It was a long straight road. Only the cows could see you. And he's like, that's amazing. I said, yeah, I think so too, but no science book can explain to me what happened here. And I had more and more of these experiences. And eventually, I thought to myself, okay, one can be a coincidence. Two can be a coincidence. Three, maybe not. Four, five, six, how many times should something happen before we no longer consider it to be a coincidence? So I tried to prove it to a skeptical friend, and frankly, it scared her. And it was never my intention to scare anyone. So sometimes the events that happened in my life scared me too. And I'll give you another example, and this is all from the book Anomalies. I had a lucid dream. This was years later. I had all grown up now. I got married. <laughs> and I had an experience of a lucid dream. In that dream, I was standing on a road, and I was told in the dream that I was going to the house of a serial killer. 
And I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> sure. Must be some kind of Jack the Ripper museum or some sort. And I crossed the road. I saw two pillars on either side, hedges, and a grindstone path. And I went up the grindstone path, and I came to a house with side entrance steps. And as I went up these steps, I came into a hallway. And the hallway was empty. The house was empty. So I went to the living room. The living room was empty. And suddenly it turned dark. And black light showed up. And it lit up blood stains. And it freaked me out. So I turned around and left the house. I went back into the hallway. And suddenly there were two pairs of Wellington boots there. And they weren't there before. So I stepped out of the house and followed the track back. And there was someone mowing the lawn. And on the other side, there was a hole in the ground, like a grave, like a dug grave. And this person mowing the lawn looked at me like, you know too much. And I just wanted to run. And as I sped up my pace, and walked out that gate. I was looking for a bus or a train station, and I thought, why am I looking for a bus or a train station? I have a car. So in real life, I realized that I have a car, so there was no need for me to look for a bus or a train station. But why was I doing that in my dream? And then I started running and running and running, and I came across the wall of a monastery. And I got totally lost and disoriented. And I thought to myself, if I can only find the swimming pool, then I know where I am. Didn't make any sense to me. And I kept running and running and running. And I got lost in the forest. And I woke up. And I told this dream to my then husband and, <laughs> and joked that I must have been watching too much CSI on TV. <laughs> Until about two weeks later, I saw, I, I was in the garden outside our house, and I thought it was time to get something to drink. <laughs> and so I went inside and opened the fridge and poured myself a drink. And the TV was playing. And on the TV, I just caught the news report that a serial killer had been arrested in Belgium. And that piqued my, my interest. And I looked, and I see the stone pillars, the grindstone path, and the road I was standing on when I was told I was going to the house of a serial killer. And when I was standing there, I stood there nailed to the ground. Honestly, I nearly dropped my glass. And when more and more of these reports came out in the news, it turned out that a lot of these things could be confirmed. So you see the hedges and stone pillars in the gate of my dream you see here a swimming pool. Can you see that? This is where they dug up the swimming pool. Why? Because there was a body under the swimming pool. Guess what? They found bodies in a forest. Guess what? He actually picked up girls from a bus or a train station. Guess what? One of those girls was from a convent or a monastery school. And all these elements from my dreams showed up in real life. It took me more than a year to find the courage to go to police in Belgium and actually tell my statement. Because this was so unbelievable, even for me, that who would actually believe me? <clears throat> and then I found that. When I got to Belgium, and I had to be transported to the commissioner of police in Belgium, and he actually told me, yes, every single detail in your dream matches what we found. But now I have to refer you to the French police, because in Belgium the case is closed, and he committed offenses in France. Now, I didn't have the courage to continue on to the French police. I can tell you it was enough for me. Is this remote viewing? No, it is not remote viewing. Even though it seems that way, there's a lot of confusion about it. 
So remote viewing definition is the use using extrasensory perception following scientific protocols and consistent reporting procedures. So there's a learning process involved in that. But why was I so interested in learning remote viewing? Because most of all, I wanted evidence. I wanted to prove it to myself that this was real. This was not imagination. And the only way I could do that was use a scientific method. Now, it took me a lot of time until I came across what remote viewing really was. So a psychic has a natural ability. It has a natural ability of clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, otherwise known as extrasensory perception. But a remote viewer is scientific-based or science-based, so learns the scientific protocols and structured procedures of recording and reporting extrasensory perceptions. And I think Tony mentioned before that it is so important to have consistent structure in reporting so that you can measure what's going on. And it makes it easier to analyze the data and compare it to others. If you only do your own thing, everyone does it differently. But if everyone has been taught in the same structure, we can now start comparing the differences. We can now start comparing the things that are common denominators. How does this work? So, in the 1970s, they started remote viewing research at SRI. And Hal Putoff and Russell Targ were the pioneers in that. But they also had a very, very good psychic who actually was the one who developed remote viewing. Ingo Swan um, basically was the father of remote viewing, as we call him now. Uh, he was a New York artist, and he was also um, a research uh, participant in many of the research programs at the ASPR in New York. And he was invited to go over to um, Menlo Park, California. So he actually was not the ordinary person. <laughs> he, um, uh, he made excellent, excellent progress within the program. And he coined uh, remote viewing. So the research shown by Russell Targ and Hill Podoff, um, is ESP possible? Yes. Can, what can we do to stop it? Nothing. There is no way to stop remote viewing. Um, can, who can do this? Well, almost anyone. They had a research subject called Hella Hamid, and Hella was a photographer, and she said she had no prior psychic experiences. And she was asked to do some tests as a control group. And she scored better than the rest of them. <laughs> so yes, any, almost anyone can do this. Um, how is this possible? Well, we have some theories, especially in theoretical physics. But we have a hard time actually pinning it down. The, the reason why the research was funded was because of military application. At that time, they had the idea that the Russians were into psychic spying. And you've got to remember, this was the Cold War. So if the Russians were into it, they definitely had to research it. And so Helpotov was tasked with, can you prove this is nonsense? Because these reports, intelligence reports that we get in, we, we, can't, we can't do anything with it. Can you disprove it? Well, in fact, he proved the op opposite of it. He actually proved that it could work. So can it be used against us? Yes. Can we use it ourselves? Yes. How can we best apply it as an intelligence tool, but not as a standalone intelligence tool? Every intelligence tool needs to be confirmed by something else. Can it be improved? Well, I think Dr. Ed May would argue with me, but I think, yes, it can be improved. Maybe not on the psychic scale, but definitely on the way we communicate. So there are different types of remote viewing. We have coordinate remote viewing, and that's how it started. 
So Ingo Swan was doing research and he, he was kind of getting bored with the research and said, can I do something myself? Can I test it myself? Do something more exciting than just what's in the box on the shelf? And so he suggested to remote view the weather. And so they randomly selected um, cities in the US and at that time we didn't have Google. <laughs> So they actually had to phone up the weather station in order to find out what the weather was. And after several trials, Ingo started to get results. And one of them was Phoenix, Arizona. And if you've ever been to Phoenix, it's pretty much like Perth, <laughs> dry. <laughs> and normally in summer, it never rains. But Ingo actually said, on that day, it's raining in Phoenix, which was very unusual. And so they phoned up the weather station, and yes, it was raining in Phoenix. Later on, when he moved to SRI, he wanted to keep himself blind from whatever city it is, because if you mention New York, everyone can see, okay, skyscrapers. You don't have to be psychic to come up with that. So how can we be blind to it? And he thought, okay, let's, let's use map coordinates. And so the map coordinates were used as latitude, longitude for specific locations. And then the criticism was that, you know, what if remote viewers have eidetic memories? What if they can memorize the coordinates of Earth and tell what is approximately there? Well, that's a valid suggestion. So they changed it to random numbers. And surprisingly, the results were just as good. <laughs> so yes, random numbers can be assigned to a target on the planet, or any planet. Extended uh, controlled remote viewing was later developed, and it's on a similar basis as coordinate remote viewing. In fact, it's exactly the same with different terminology. So controlled remote viewing was coined by the military guys who started to teach the public and we're afraid to use Ingo's terminology. And it's actually a more apt name because what we do is in a controlled way. It has nothing to do with coordinates anymore. Extended remote viewing is different to CRV in the fact that when you do CRV, you are in a slightly altered state of mind, but you're still fully conscious. You're writing with pen and paper, and so you're not going off anywhere. You're right here and now, in your mind, you can perceive distant places, distant targets. With extended remote viewing, you go into a deep altered state, producing more alpha and theta brain waves, and you stay under in that period longer. Um, the remote viewing process is an undulating process. So you go under, come up, go under, come up, and we'll discuss that a little bit later as well. Then there is associative remote viewing, which is mostly used for um, stock markets, betting outcomes, games outcomes, uh, yes or no questions, up or down, red or black. Um, what they do is they associate two distinctly different picture targets to one question. And the question could be, um, could, would my team win the next game, right? So it could be, a, yes could be a fluffy cat, and no could be a square building. Now if the remote viewers get a random target number associated with a the question, they would either ske sketch a fluffy cat or something like a square building. But if they ske sketch a pyramid, either the question is invalid or the remote viewer is having a bad day. But they scored about 70, 80% above chance with these things. Now, if you have 70 to 80% above chance in the stock market or in games, you're beating the odds. <laughs> All right, so there are a few misconceptions. This seems an unrealistic skill. And so people have unrealistic expectations. And one of these things is remote viewers should know and see everything. Well, guess what? 
Nobody can, because you can only see what you focus on. If I see this one lady in the room, the rest of the room is fading away, and I only can describe this lady. I have no idea. So remote viewing is vague and useless. Well, that's like saying language is vague and useless. If I communicate and stand here and talk in Dutch, nobody in the room, well, maybe few, would understand what I talk about. Why? Because we're not speaking the same language, right? So language depends greatly on what is communicated in what way and if the other person can make sense of what is being communicated. Remote viewing is or should be easy. No, it's not. It's not easy. It actually, any skill takes time and effort to learn. Remote viewers should be 100% correct 100% of the time. Well, remote viewing is based on perception and communication. Guess what humans are not so good at? <laughs> Even the best of the best fail at times. And we don't expect a dart player to throw bullseye 100% of the time. We call that unrealistic. Well, why would we say the same for people who do a similar thing? I'd like to hit bullseye every time. I don't. <laughs> and to prove to you how difficult this is and how challenging, I created a little thought experiment for you. So I'd like to take you on a journey of remote viewing. Your target reference number is 11114141. Now, your mind drops into, like Google Maps, it drops into a location, and there you are. Can anyone tell me where this is? No. Guess what normal people would say? Well, if you give me a long straight road, I can't do anything with that because this could be anywhere in the world, right? Fair enough. Okay, let's look around. Then you see this. Can anyone tell me where this is? No one? Well, very good. I can't either. So you get an initial perception of an open, wide, flat, and desolate area with some hard, rocky, sandy, gritty surface and some rough, prickly shrub or vegetation. Also perceive a long, flat surface, possibly a road, and surrounded by fields, however, no significant features. So you see actually a snippet of a remote viewing session there. Is this accurate? Well, we have no way of determining that because we can only determine accuracy if there is some evidence. Could this be used in a practical case? No, because it's quite literally a needle in a haystack. Then you get an impression of this, perspiring male, sweaty running socks, male driving, something weird. Perception of a flat, warm black surface, likely a road. Quick, quick flash of the number 61. Perceived stinky, sweaty, warm, clammy, and it smells to me like smelly socks. And there appears to be a sense of moving, warm wind, and a whirring sound. Okay, then there is a perception of a hyper energetic, nervous, stressed male who appears to be moving and there's a sense of on time. He appears to be agitated, angry, determined, obsessed and it's almost like this person had too much coffee or energy drinks. Okay, so could this be used in a practical case? Well, the information is a little bit more specific but we still don't know. It's difficult to identify. So who is this agitating, perspiring, angry male? And why is he so agitated? And then you get this. So it's dark, impression, some kind of fuel station, flashing lights. OK, it appears to be dark. There's a sense, there's a flash of light, and we're moving past some sign of a white, 
and red circular orange, uh, red circular star-shaped logo reminds me of a Texaco logo. Now I say it reminds me of a Texaco logo. It is not a Texaco logo, but it's something similar. Moving past flashing orange lights, there is some barrier for roadworks, or like some barrier of roadworks. Then a tan is perceived, but also a feeling of rushing, moving, holding, like holding on to something. And this something be be appears to be inside, locked away, trapped, in the dark, hidden and moving. Is the information accurate? Well, we still don't know. Um, could it be used? Well, the combination of these elements narrows things down a little bit, but it's still generic. Right? Then you perceive something like this. It's dark. There appears to be a sense of control. Something contained in a tight space and it feels claustrophobic. It feels to me like being locked in a small moving space. Although it's dark, you perceive a clear picture of a male, dark brown hair, tan complexion, South American looking, moustache, some facial hair, brown eyes, possibly injured shoulder, and appears to be hyper, angry and determined. Well, could this be used in a practical case? We don't have a name or a vehicle registration, which is what the police normally really want. But we do have some, a sequence of perceived events now, what I perceive may not be very accurate because, like I said, we're terrible at perception at times. So we've got to give it some leeway. General locations with some recognizable features, a sketch of a person of interest, we don't know if our perceptions are correct. The target appears to be in a field, nondescript and hard to find. The target appears to be transported in an enclosed, confined, moving space. The time of day appears to be evening or night, passing a fuel station and a logo with a star shape, passing orange flashing lights like in roadworks. Um, person driving vehicle appears to be male, South American looking sea sketch. And the person driving the vehicle appears to be hiding something, or more likely someone, because of the perception of feeling claustrophobic. I mean, a weapon shipment is not feeling claustrophobic. So it's more likely someone in a moving, confined space. So what's the story? What's this client looking for? Can anyone tell me? Missing persons sounds like maybe an abduction, yeah. Trafficking of people, of people yeah. Abduction or trafficking of people. Well, this was the target. Sketch and describe the location of Molly Tibbets. Well, all I got was 11, 11, 41, 41. Right? On the 18th of July, Molly Tibbets went out jogging that evening and did not return. A Chevrolet Malibu was seen driving multiple times on CCTV in the area Molly was jogging. On the 18th of August, a request from the FBI came in via someone else, so I don't work directly for the FBI, um, with urgent info required and only that number. On the 19th of August, because it was urgent, I worked through the day, and I sent the information to the contact for the FBI. And on the 21st of August, the arrest warrant for Christian Behina Rivera was issued. Rivera was the person matching the RV description, and also happened to be the owner of a Chevrolet Malibu, as seen on CCTV. So Rivera confessed to the murder and led um, to the location of Molly Tibbetts. And that was a secluded cornfield where her body was recovered. So what happened? Rivera had been following Molly in his car at first. And finally started to run beside her to chat with her. 
Well, she didn't want to know, and she told him to leave her alone or she would call the police. Now, this would be devastating for Rivera because he was illegally in the US, so he would not allow her to make that phone call. He abducted and killed her and hid her body in a secluded cornfield. So, target reference number 11114141. Target is in a field hard to find and nondescript. Correct. Confirmed by police after confession. Male with tan skin, dark hair, dark brown eyes, mustache, and some facial hair, South American looking, was nervous, agitated, and angry. Correct. Confirmed by confession statement. He has sweaty socks, and it seems he has been running a marathon before getting into the car. Correct. Confirmed by confession statement and CCTV footage. And this male transported someone in the boot of the vehicle, possibly the target. Correct. Confirmed by forensic evidence. To get to the field, he drove past the fuel station, signed similar to the Texaco logo. Well, Lone Star truck stop at Denny's fuel station. He um, drove past roadworks with orange flashing lights. Well, that was confirmed by police, and the road number was 61. That was incorrect. The road number was actually 21. So was the information accurate? Yeah, it's as accurate as a report of any witness of a crime. And could this be used in a practical case? Yes, well, in fact, it has been used. So in some cases, the person can be prompted to confess if you know details that you know, they only know. Um, or investigators could look at certain aspects of a case that they might have overlooked before. Working for law enforcement has a downside. I can only tell you this because the case is closed. If I had told you this beforehand, I would have probably caused obstruction of justice, right? So confidentiality information can only be submitted to law enforcement case uh, officer on the case. And that is very important. Many psychics out there try to prove themselves, put it in the press. What you're doing is obstructing justice. I know it is difficult to prove, but what I can tell you is that the one, the person I send this information to, I have the email. I have the email and the date of my session. So I can clearly prove that I have done this before he was arrested. Unusual witnesses. Professional remote viewer has been trained to observe and report information in a clear, concise, and unbiased way. As unbiased as humanly possible. Dangerous. Providing accurate details only the perpetrator could know will put you on the suspect list. Right? The reason why I don't work cases in Australia, mostly in Europe or the US, is because my passport can clearly show that I was not in the area at the time that that happened. <laughs> missing persons. You cannot provide information to family or friends of missing persons. Unfortunately, in many cases, family members or friends of the missing person are involved in them going missing and maybe that person has a reason to go missing. Unsolicited info, unless law enforcement officers specifically ask for help, if you submit any information, your information will likely be discarded. Due diligence, you're working double blind. Anyone can give me a target. I might not accept it because I work double blind and they could basically task me with anything, the layout of a bank, for instance, to commit the next robbery. So you've got to know who you accept these targets from. Um, and that's the downside of working double blind. It requires tr trust. Legal issues, remote viewing crosses borders. And the legislative requirements are different in different countries. In some countries, I need to put a disclaimer down that this is for entertainment purposes only, even though it's not entertaining at all. Um, in some cases, the use of ESP is punishable by death penalty. Health and safety. A witness of a crime 
will have support. They have counselors, psychological reports, um, support from family members, friends, community. But a witness who wasn't there cannot get the same support, right? Because technically, you weren't in the area, so you're not considered a witness. Um, professional development, ongoing research and development is required to establish solid credentials. You can only do this when you have solid credentials and a proven track record. Other uses are creative projects like creative writing. Uh, science fiction writers love this because you can look into the future. Visual arts, novel ideas or concepts, futurology, archaeology, cryptology, deciphering things, financial markets, as I said, uh, associative remote viewing, and health and science, only in conjunction with medical experts. If you do a remote viewing session for someone with a medical problem, it still needs to be assessed by a medical expert but you might give that medical expert a hint of what to look for. Questions? Uh, just a comment, actually, that the, uh, when you mentioned about the uh, psychics involved with the police, <coughs> mm -hmm. crimes, yes, I have seen cases where people of psychics have gone to the police and been arrested or been a very regarded especially as being a, a perpetrator of the crime, which... In, which it, um, Unfortunately for them, yeah. they didn't realise what sort of a, a mess they can get into, really. And uh, they don't. If you don't pe teach people who are already psychic a way to deal with it responsibly and a, a way to protect themselves from making the mistakes that I've, other people and myself have already made um, and learn from them so that they don't get arrested in those cases. And that's one of the things why I'm teaching people remote viewing and more than that, because I think it's my responsibility and the responsibility of the rest of the world to deal with this in a responsible manner. And I think that was a really good one. Hello. I just have a question about uh, the ethics of remote viewing. Mm -hmm. So doing psychic or mediumship work, the mediums usually, if, for example, um, they ask a question or they're working with the spirit world, they might be shown that they're not allowed to see something because it's private, mm -hmm. as though this is, information isn't available to tell someone else mm -hmm. about someone else. So when you're doing remote viewing, is there uh, sort of ethics around what sort of scenarios you should be looking into? For example, doing police work, you're trying to solve a crime, but people could use it for all kinds of things that aren't necessarily like a breaching people's privacy, for example. Mm -hmm. So I'm just interested to hear about your perception on that. Okay, yeah, it's a very good question and it comes up in many, many times. And obviously you need to very, very carefully consider what people's privacy is. Um, and I'll give you a good example. I had a uh, request from someone who had met a young lady at a fair. Um, they were both engaged with their family so they couldn't talk to each other for too long. And they both seemed to want to keep in contact, but they lost sight of each other. Um, and he requested me to remote view her. And again, I only work either with police, if it's a police case, or with lawful private investigators who will then try and locate the person Ask the person, do you want to have contact with this person? If the answer is no, they cannot legally provide the name to the other person. So I put things in place to responsibly deal with that information. Um, with remote viewing, you can look into anything. I like to take the more responsible approach, but not everyone does, and that's kind of scary. And I think uh, people who are working for the CIA didn't have these issues because they had license to remote view wherever they wanted to, right? We are members of the public. We don't have, we have to consider the legal and ethical cases. So I think, yeah, it was a really good question. I hope I answered it. <laughs> yeah, hi. <clears throat> Looking with remote viewing into the future mm -hmm. for 
just yourself. Yes. Could you um, have a sense of what global warming is going to do? Whether we're going to have a GFC 2? What sort of envisioning can you ha have a sense of in your own life? Yeah, as, future, as in predicting, in the um, there's, there's several challenges with remote viewing. Doing things for yourself, you need to still be double blind. So you will need to create a target pool with questions, hundreds of them, mix it in with other people's questions, and then at random, get one of those questions out. And you don't know which one that is, so there will be just numbers. Okay. associated so, with the question. The other thing is that if you go into the future further out, it tends to be more wavy. It tends to be, the further you go into the future, the less accurate it seems to be. Um, so short-term predictions are usually more effective than the long-term predictions. It's not to say that they aren't, but it becomes a bit... Okay. Up in the air. If I were to say something like, "Will could we see a GFC two next year, 2020?" Would that be enough to just go, "Okay," give you the sense or not? Um, th that could be done, but uh, now you have what we call front-loaded me. Oh. So my own uh, ideas of what is going to happen regards that might pr might actually be incorrect because now I know what the question is and so now I start to assume that where we're going okay. the answer might be yes or the answer might be no okay. depending on my stance. So how could I do it if I said I've got a question in my mind about something um, and it's 21 22 mm -hmm. can you decipher that? I can teach you that okay. <laughs> but it's too complicated to explain that in one session right now. So, but I can teach you that, how to do that. All right, um, I, I was under the impression that um, like remote, the remote viewing is um, like a, a two-person job, so like a remote viewer and an interpreter. So I was wondering, how, how does that work if you're also interpreting and you might have your own biases and Okay, like so what, what you're referring to is that there's many people involved in remote viewing normally. There is a client, then the client goes to a tasker. The tasker sets up the tasks and passes it on to the remote viewer. So the remote viewer absolutely has no idea what the question is. That is the best way to go about it. Um, sometimes a remote viewer also has a monitor, and that is someone who sits at the desk with them and guides them through, and the monitor should not know what the question is either, but guides them during their process. Okay. So I hope I answered your yep. question. Thank you. Let's have a quick break. And, uh, <laughs>